All right. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Acts, please. Chapter one. Uh, We'll have a brief introduction and we'll get right into the material. If you're new with us, thank you for coming to our class today. We would like very much to have you be a regular member of our class. Uh, Because we meet in the sanctuary, of course, we cannot offer you coffee and donuts at Boston Avenue. But we offer you serious Bible study every Sunday morning. We're looking at the most significant passages in the Bible. It doesn't mean that anything ought to be left out. It simply means we're, we're going through a third time, this time just doing highlights, where we did every verse of every chapter the first two times. We've made it now through all 39 books of the Hebrew Scriptures and the first four books of the Christian Scriptures. Uh, You know there are 27 in the Christian scriptures, so we have 23 more to go. Many of them very small now as we get into the epistles, but not the book of Acts. It's a a long work, and and, uh, we're not going to deal with all of it. I intend for us to deal with the most important parts of uh, the second work of Luke. Let's pray. What a beautiful December morning you prepared for us in Tulsa, Oklahoma, O God. We thank you for it. This is a special time of year, as you well know, the Advent, the coming toward. We believe that if we move toward you, we find that you've always been moving toward us and that we can meet you because you want to meet us and that you want to help us. You want to make life better, richer, fuller, more meaningful for us. And we want to do your will to help your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We turn to your book and look for those things forever true about you and about us. And we offer our best effort in Christ's holy name. Amen. All right. When Luke wrote, he did not give a title to his scroll. Scholars did that centuries later. And Bishop William Willimon, when he was still dean of the chapel at Duke Divinity School and Duke University, wrote a commentary on the book of Acts in which he said, scholars got the title wrong. The title is not correct. If one picks up this book and reads the Acts of the Apostles, one is hoping to find out what happened to Peter and Andrew, James and John, Nathaniel and Philip and all the others. And that isn't going to happen. That in fact this book is not about the Acts of the Apostles, Apostles, it is a recording of the acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, The bishop is convinced that Luke is really writing about the acts of the Holy Spirit. Now remember that these two words are very important. They convey for us the transcendence and the eminence of God. Transcendent, meaning God is big enough to climb over, the Latin literally, transcendere, to climb across all of creation. And the more we learn about the universe and how many billions and billions of stars there are, then this one is really big indeed. This one is, this word means set apart, So that means that if you read a poem about God being a falling leaf and a falling snow, that's wrong, wrong. God is none of that. You may see God's creative handiwork in a snowflake you catch on a black glove, but snowflakes are not God and falling leaves are not God. God is the one set apart. He is wholly other than that which he has created, different from us. Okay, we are sort of like God, but God is not like us in that God is infinite. God is really, really big. And so again, Dr. Rudolf Otto's book on the holy uh, emphasizes this uh, tremendous mystery, he calls it, the mysterium tremendum in Latin, the tremendous mystery of God. So we never want to lose this part that caused people in the Bible to be greatly afraid whenever they got too close. Dr. Fred Craddock says it's almost like walking under one of those really high-voltage electric wires that hums up over your head. The word spirit, of course, you know in Hebrew is the word ruach. In Greek, it is pneuma. You would spell it in Greek 
I mean, using our alphabet, P-N-E-U-M-A, and it's the word we have in pneumonia. I had eight, eight patients to see last Wednesday, and four of them had pneumonia. Uh, something wrong with the breath, with the lungs. And so this word means wind, breath, or spirit, uh, as does the word ruach in Hebrew. So this is about the closeness of God. When a new baby is born, it's God who fills this child with life. God who quickens this little body and makes it truly human, child of God. So the one big enough to climb over all the universe who's as close to you as your own breath. How did this one, one God, how did this God perform act after the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what Luke's concerned about. What did the Holy Spirit do after Jesus, the flesh and blood child of Mary, was gone, no longer here with us? What happened next? And as in his gospel, we're going to be dealing with Luke's gospel, as you know, all this year in the preaching. I'm dealing with the lections uh, from Luke's gospel. And this morning, uh, in the in the worship service, if you haven't been yet, uh, let me just tell you briefly that the lection for this morning shows very clearly why we call three of the Gospels synoptics and yet why our mothers and fathers put four of them in, in the Holy Writ. Because as one reads the lection this morning, the first three verses have 64 Greek words in them. Okay, I've got a gospel parallel in English. I've got one in Greek. Okay, the one in Greek you can really tell because the English, of course, has been translated. It's one more language removed. But in the Greek, you can see Matthew and Luke. And when I was taking Greek all those years ago, I actually went through and with a, a, a map color, uh, colored in those passages where Matthew and Luke are the same and where Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the same. I had a different color and so on. So it was very easy for me to spot it. So when you get to this third chapter of Luke, from which the lection comes today, in the first three verses of the lection, 7, 8, and 9, there are 64 Greek words, and Matthew has 60 of them. Okay, Luke has four words that differ only, only four in that whole first three verses. And then immediately, Luke gives you five verses that nobody else has. Five verses not in Mark, not in Matthew, certainly not in John. Luke gives you more of what John the baptizer was actually saying than does any other writer in the, in the New Testament. So that's why we have three that sort of look alike. I mean, here are 60, ver 60 words that are identical in one very brief passage. So Matthew and Luke, you know, we think Luke was looking at Matthew and Mark, had them both right in front of him there. And so he sees them and he chooses to use this long passage from Matthew. Yes, yes, this is good stuff. And then he says, oh, but there was more that John was saying. And he gives you five verses. If you haven't been to church, I'll deal with those five verses uh, in the sermon a little bit later. But for now, let me simply say uh, we have four Gospels, one of them written by the same person who wrote the Acts of the Holy Spirit. All right. Let's take a look at verse one and get underway. In the first book, and of course, literally it would be a scroll. When you and I say book, we usually think of something bound. Uh, it wasn't bound, it was rolled up. Uh, if you've been to Temple Israel on a worship night or Congregation of Amuna, you've seen them uh, take from their ark, uh, reminding them of the Ark of the Covenant where the tablets of the Ten Commandments were. Uh, there's a beautiful place in both the synagogue and the temple has a curtain, and they push a button, and the curtain comes back, and you see these beautiful scrolls. Uh, I was at Temple Israel, Gail and I were a couple of Friday nights ago. I think there are five in there, as I recall, five scrolls, but, but uh, they're all the same. They're all the same. They just are beautiful scrolls that have been given to Temple Israel at one time or another by, by different people. But in this rolled-up material, uh, you have what Luke wrote to a scroll. So I wrote a scroll and now I've written another scroll. All right. He addresses this to someone named Theophilus. And I told you when we were at the Gospel of Luke what the different possibilities are for this word. Do you remember what those were? What are the possibilities here? Because New Testament scholars for 2,000 years have not found this person referred to any other place. Dr. Swafford? Yeah, that's right. 
This word right here in Greek means God. That is the Greek word for God. And this word means, yeah, it's one of the words for love in Greek. Friendship is the, the, the way we left John's Gospel last Sunday. Are you my friend? Ah, you know everything. I am your friend. Okay, we'll go with that. If you can't give me agape, I'll take phileo, so Jesus seems to be saying. All right, we have this in our word Philadelphia, I've told you. The city of brotherly love. In Greek, it can mean brothers or sisters. Uh, so it's, it's not gender exclusive here. Okay, so it could mean simply, could mean just lover of God or friend of God. Dear friend of God. So, in effect, he could have been writing to any one of us or all of us together. But there are other possibilities. One is that it's simply a person whom Luke knows and really cares for and wants to prepare this. But scholars think if, it, if this name was a specific person, he was probably a patron. Okay, simply meaning that it takes a long time to write all that Luke wrote. I mean, his gospel's long. And now this scroll is very long as well. And he's painstakingly writing, not with a pen you can buy that writes for three weeks at a time. Dip and write and dip and write and dip and write. Okay, take a long time to do that. So, what's he going to eat? Who's going to look after him? Uh, when Constantine sent his mother to the Holy Land, you remember, to search out all the most significant places in the life of Jesus and build churches over them, she took with her a very prominent scholar named Jerome. And when she got to the place of Jesus' birth, she was told, this is the place. This is the cave that was underneath the inn. That's where he was born. Animals were kept in that cave underneath the inn. And so Constantine's mother, Catherine, said, well, Jerome, you're staying here, right here, till you translate all of the Bible into the language of the Roman people, the street language, the vulgar, vulgar, the Vulgate it became known as. All right, Jerome has to eat, sleep, rest. So Catherine is bankrolling him while he does that. She gives him a job to do, but she also is his patron. She takes care of him to be sure that he's properly cared for while he does this important work. So some scholars Probably a majority from my reading thinks that's who Theophilus was, uh, a patron who's, uh, who's providing enough resources, doesn't mean Luke's getting rich or anything, but he's, he's being cared for enough that he can devote his time and energy to writing these two scrolls. But it may not be. I mean, place your money, take your choice. It could simply be dear friend of God. Let's go on. Luke, you see, believes these two time periods are critical for the new Gentile Christians to know as much about as possible. That is, the life of Jesus, including his death and resurrection, and what happened after that. That's what he set out to write. What about those roughly 33 years of Jesus' life, and what about the years immediately following? But again, it's not the people, even those whom Jesus had called to be his dearest, closest friends, who are the focal point of his work. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. So, Luke believes Jesus of Nazareth, Mary's child, grown up, put a face on God. But Luke also believes he put a face on the Holy Spirit. So, if you understand God better by having known Jesus, then you should understand the Holy Spirit better for having known Jesus. Or, as Dr. Paul Tillich, uh, writing from uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York 50 years ago, probably when he wrote, wrote his uh, most important works, a three-volume systematic theology. Gee, it cost me a lot of money when I had to buy those three books, and Gail and I had so little back in graduate school. But I still have those books of Paul Tillich, and in there he talks about the Bible as being the norm for theological truth, simply meaning our knowledge of God. We know more about God in this book than any other way of knowing about God. This book. All right, but then he said, this is our norm. But even the norm has been normed, he said. That's the way scholars talk, you remember. That's the way they talk. And they also throw in a foreign language just to make it more difficult for you if you're sitting there taking notes and studying for an exam. The norma normans, he called it. The norma normans. The norm that norms the norm is Jesus Christ. 
And so what I've tried to do this whole last year, if you've been a regular attender at worship, you know that when I've dealt with scriptures from, from the Hebrew part of the Bible, I have often quoted these scholars whom Rabbi Charles Sherman tells me are some of their very best. Rabbi Gunter Plout, Rabbi Nahum Sarna, and others. Books that I bought from Temple Israel Bookstore when Charles said, this is a really good one, this is a really good one. Uh, this is one I would trust completely. And some of these professors of his from his own seminary. First, every week I tried to help you understand what was this author saying in his time to his people. What was Jeremiah or Micah or Amos or Hosea, all these others we dealt with last year, trying to say to his people in his time? But then I felt it was fair, and Rabbi Sherman agrees with me, then it's fair for me to say, but what do we Gentile Christians see in this? You see? So first we need to be as fair as we can be to the original author. What do we know about the author? What do we know about the time and circumstances into which he was writing? So I've said to you, I don't think Jeremiah had a clue about Jesus of Nazareth. But he had a great faith in Israel's God. And that one day Israel's God would do this dramatic thing. And you and I believe that dramatic thing God did was Jesus, Messiah, our Christ. Okay? So you and I are having our experiences, our knowledge of God normed by Jesus Christ. Okay, I think Luke would agree with that 100%. And he's saying... And remember, Luke is writing to a Gentile audience. No question. Where I told you Matthew was writing to Jews and trying to get them to see in Jesus someone greater than Moses. Not with Luke. He's writing to Gentiles, to you and me, people like us. You will find, as we, uh, you did in the Gospel, you will find again here in, in this, this scroll, that he explains things to Gentiles that Jews would know. Uh, things that, that somebody said or somebody did that Jews would know but Gentiles don't know. And so he has to give a little more explanation. He believes for those coming into the church now that by the time he writes, the, the, Jews have, the next generation of Jews are back at the synagogue. It has become a Gentile movement. Almost 100% by the time Luke writes. It's a Gentile movement. And so he's writing to Gentiles. And he's saying, in effect, I mean, he doesn't know about Christian scriptures yet. He knows somebody's tried to write down the most important things about Jesus. We believe he had in front of him Mark's account and Matthew's account, not John, probably. But he had Mark and, and Matthew. And he had another document that we call the quella, the source of these the teachings, the parables. We think he had all of those in front of him. But none of that is called scripture in Luke's time. Scripture, the 39 scrolls of the Hebrew writings. No Christian scriptures. The Christian Bible, as you and I would call it, was not agreed upon for 300 years until finally it was, okay, we're going with these 27 and no more. These 27 will be our holy writ, along with the Hebrew scriptures, of course. But I mean, 27 coming out of the Christian period. So Luke doesn't, he doesn't know the letters of Paul as being scripture. He doesn't know any of these scrolls as being Scripture. Scripture is the Hebrew Bible. But he believes what he's written is what Gentiles need to know if they're going to be Christian. The, the Gospel and what happened right after. What was God doing in Jesus Christ and what is God doing in the Holy Spirit? Okay, is that pretty clear? Okay, he thinks these two scrolls are key. All right, let's take a look. Start with chapter 1. In the first book, and I mentioned that would have been a scroll, nothing bound, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus, so see, it's, he's very specific. This is about a person, a flesh and blood person. All that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. All right? Now, let's stop again and say that we don't have a Nicene Creed by the time Luke writes. If you've been to worship the last two Sundays, or already today, you know that the, the creed we're using for Advent is the Nicene Creed. So if you've forgotten what that looks like, that's the creed we're using. Uh, we have nine affirmations of faith in, the, in, in, our, in our Methodist hymn book and book of worship. 
And for a time after this, after the Penseras arrived, uh, Dr. Pensera tried to take us through all nine of them. And I finally said, you know, Joel, uh, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I think there's some real value in people's being able to recite an affirmation. So how about if we don't do all nine of them, let's uh, concentrate on three or four and use those three or four over and over, but a different one with each season. And so that's what he's done really well for us. So in Kingdom Tide, we'll use one of those all the way through Kingdom Tide. And then we use a different one in, in Advent. We'll use a different one in Epiphany and so on. All right? That's, that's what we're doing if you haven't picked up on that. In Advent, it's the Nicene Creed. So the Nicene Creed talks about the humanity of Jesus, very man of very man, and the fact that Almighty God was somehow mysteriously present in him in a way he never had been in any other human being, okay? And hasn't been in one since, as far as we Christians are concerned. He did this one time. Now, the Christ will come again at the end time, but in the meantime, we have this one person in whom God was present. But he was a real person, too. And Luke emphasizes that in his gospel. And now, in case you've forgotten what the first scroll he wrote was all about, he tells you a little bit. Verse 3. After his suffering, and he means Jesus, of course, he presented himself alive to them. And them here is uh, the antecedent is apostles. He appeared again to his apostles during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now notice here, Dr. Brandon Scott and others who spent their whole lifetimes, adult lifetimes, studying the parables of Jesus. Dr. Brandon Scott's a Roman Catholic, not a priest. He is a Roman Catholic scholar who has had this distinguished chair at Phillips Theological Seminary for many years, a disciple of Christ Seminary. He is a Roman Catholic. He has spent 40 years of an adult lifetime focused on the parables of Jesus. That's been, you know, 40 years. And he says, I believe every parable of Jesus is about the kingdom of God. That's what he came to talk about. That's what he talks about over and over and over. And you can't really understand the parables unless you understand every one of them is trying to give you a clue as to what the kingdom of God would look like if it ever happened here on earth. And that it does. And sometimes in places... The kingdom is right there. You should be able to see it and recognize it, but it's not perfected here the way it is in heaven. Okay, so here Luke, you know, is saying what Dr. Brandon Scott and a number of others have said. This concentration on the parables of Jesus really began with a German scholar, Dr. Joachim Jeremias. Joachim Jeremias was the one who, as far as we can tell in church history, said, of all the things we have in the four Gospels, the clearest picture we have of the heart and mind of Jesus is found in the parables. Look at the parables. Even Jesus said over and over, I didn't really come to heal. I came to teach and to preach. Okay, the crowds came because he was healing. But he would quickly say, that wasn't really why God sent me. He sent me to teach and preach. So Luke is saying what Dr. Joachim Jeremias and others who followed after him, believing this is, this is the key. He's talking about the kingdom of God. Yes, Dr. Swiber? Huh? Yes, sir. I think, I think uh, yes, I, uh, the question was, is this one reason he's told the disciples, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody about this. He's got a short period of time. He's got a short period of time, and he's concentrating effort on those disciples as much as he can. The crowds keep intervening, intervening, and he's moved with compassion, the Bible says. When he sees them, he's moved with compassion, but he keeps withdrawing again to be with the disciples. There's so much they need to know in such a short time to teach them. I think, yeah. Okay, let's go in a little bit farther. Verse 4. While staying with them... That's the apostles again. Jesus ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. Now, the promise. I remember back in seminary, one of my professors said, term paper, write, what is the promise of God? 
what is the promise of God? And so you get out of concordance and you start looking. And gee, the word promise is used several hundred times from Genesis to Revelation. And you have to start, you know, trying to hone that down. What is the promise of God? Okay, for Luke, the promise is, in this instance, the Holy Spirit is going to come next in a new and dramatic way. And you will have dunamis power to be witnesses. By the time Luke writes, disciple after disciple has met violent death. They're being hanged. They're being crucified. They're being thrown into prison. To have the power to keep on witnessing, to keep on telling the story, telling the story, telling the story. That's our job. Tell God's story and let the Holy Spirit convince others that it's true. Every week, I understand my role as being as prepared as I know how to be to help God tell his story. Uh, I work hours after all these years, I start every week with a stack of commentaries. I mean, if you were to go up to my office right now, unlock the door, uh, I could do it for you. You will see stacked on my desk the commentaries that I'll be working on first thing in the morning. And I will spend all week, I mean, I've got eight really good commentaries on Luke's gospel. And that's the one I'm preaching from this year. So I've got eight of them. And they're about this thick, each one of them. So it's a lot of material. They, they probably 18 inches tall or so. And every week, I've got them even in the order that I want to read them. You would know that, wouldn't you, Gail? <laughs> she would know. They're in this right order. <laughs> well, the right order for me. I've got favorites, you see. But I start with the text itself. First, I read, read, read the text itself. And then, aha, uh -huh, now what does... Fred Craddock think about that? What does Joseph Fitzmaier think about that? What does Alan Culpepper think about that? What does Elizabeth Octomeyer think about that? And so on. And I go through all eight of them. And I read and read and read. And of course, if they're this thick, dealing with one gospel, you know that if I'm dealing with only ten verses, I may have thirty pages to read. Uh, that's how deeply they go into each one of these passages. I understand my, my job my primary job, both in this class and in the two worship services, to tell God's story as effectively as I can. When I pray with the choirs, chapel choir at 8.30, chancel choir just before 11, I remind them we have been called to help God tell his story. Every time I meet with Sunday school teachers, I say, you've been called to help God tell his story. Tell God's story and see if the Holy Spirit will not convince people that it's true. Okay? So the promise is that God's presence, the spirit of the one who was so big, is still so big, that he could create billions, billions of stars, billions of galaxies of stars, is as close to you as your own breath. Um, tell God's story. Okay, this, he said, is what you have heard from me. John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. <clears throat> okay, so he doesn't say, now this is the promise, but that's what he's just written for you. As Luke understands the promise is the Holy Spirit's going to come and going to help you tell the story. Now, there are other promises of God. Where I am, there you shall be with me. That's in Luke. Luke tells that story. Um, it's Luke who tells the story of the thief on the cross that said, how can you rail at him? You and I deserve what we're getting. He doesn't deserve what he's getting. And Jesus turned to that one and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. That's a promise. So if you're writing a term paper, you've got to deal with a lot of promises. But for Luke, right now, it's coming of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Now that's a political question. Remember, they're still laboring with ideas about who the Messiah is. Go back to the prophets we dealt with all last year. I mean, try to remember what they were saying when things were so bad just before the fall of Jerusalem in 587. When things were so bad, 
in Babylon for 50 years when things were so bad when they got home again and found the Canaanites had reasserted themselves and had taken over all the best watering holes and the best orchards and vineyards and so on. It was Their city still lay in ruins 50 years later. I mean, every once in a while, reporters run back to New Orleans and say, look what New Orleans looks like all these years after Katrina. Well, if you had done that to Jerusalem 50 years later, sitting on top of the Temple Mount where we were in February, seeing these two mosques, there had been a beautiful, magnificent temple. And it's just a pile of ashes rained on for 50 years. That's what's sitting there. The royal residence right down below, this magnificent palace, the Antonius Fortress, just a pile of ashes 50 years later. We read about all those difficult times and how these prophets tried to inspire and encourage the people. One day God will intervene himself. One day God will come and shepherd his own people. So they don't know anything about a crucified Messiah. The gospel writers are trying to convince all of us God sent one who got crucified and he was the real one. You got to think change the way you're thinking about what a Messiah does. Well, even these who've been through the death and resurrection still are at their deepest core Jews who know these old prophetic scriptures. And so they ask, all right, if he was the Messiah, is now the time you kick these Romans out of our country and have a son of David sitting on the throne up there on the hill? They're asking a very real political question. He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has sent, sent, set by his own authority. Okay. Now, every time you see all the news media getting so worked up about the Mayan calendar or Nostradamus, they still run those old Nostradamus things on some of the cable systems every so often without asking the Mayans about their calendar until finally somebody found somebody who was a descendant of the Mayans. What does this mean? We ran out of writing material. It means you recycle. You start over. Nothing significant about the year 2012. But Hollywood had already made a movie about it, the end of times, because the Mayans said it'll come in 2012. No, they ran out of writing material. Recycle the calendar. So I'm amazed still that some weird old theologically uneducated man on the radio in California can get all the major networks talking about the day that he says the world's going to end. I'm amazed by that. But they do. So deep down somewhere, everybody has a thought about the end time. Does somebody know when it's going to happen? These folk are asking a political question. Is Israel about to be restored? Is this the time that the prophets describe when all the wealth of the nations will come to Jerusalem and everybody acknowledge Israel's God as the only true God? Well, that hasn't been given to us. Concentrate on what has been given. That's in verse 8. You're not about to know the time, nor the place, nor the periods in which God works, but you will receive dunamis. That's... We're going to mention it lots of times because Luke does. To be fair to him, we've got to keep mentioning this word over and over. Dunamis, from which we get dynamite, dynamic, dynamo. The noun is power. The verb is to be able. You shall be able because you shall have power. What you need to concentrate on is the coming of the Holy Spirit. When it has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, where he's told them to stay until they are empowered to be witnesses, then they will spread in all Judea, and the next closest territory is Samaria, and then it says to the ends of the earth, and they're still envisioning something flat. Okay, doesn't say around the world, because they don't know the world's around. To the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. In the Hebrew Scriptures, God's presence is signaled by a cloud. Why do certain Christian bodies have incense? Incense. Come Christmas Eve night, you'll see one of our three magi carrying the little incense pot. Paul Stott said, could we make it smoke? I said, I don't think so, Paul. They'll run you and me out of here. Uh, 
the little incense pot. You watch. One of the wise men is carrying one. Yeah. Uh, frankincense and myrrh. Oh, frankincense and myrrh. <laughs> Gail wants to make it smoke. Okay. Uh, when Martin Sheen wrote uh, recently about following the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostelo in Spain, he was amazed when he got to the cathedral where you know pilgrims have been going a thousand years now to this one church, believing it contains parts of the body of St. James, the brother of John, one of the sons of thunder. And so thousands of people make this pilgrimage every year. And Martin Sheen has written that when you get there and, and you have the, the mass, you participate in, in the mass in the cathedral, he said they had the biggest <laughs> incense he had ever seen. It came by cable all the way across the place and smoke was going everywhere. So smoke and cloud uh, was a way that God came. He led the children of Israel by a ball of fire at night and a cloud in the daytime. So this cloud surrounds Jesus and he leaves from their sight. While he was going, they were gazing up toward heavenly heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. Now you and I know about the people in white robes. We've, been, we've had them described before. On the morning of Jesus' resurrection, this dazzlingly white robe. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, John saw him talking with Moses. And their robes just were startlingly white. It literally says in the Greek, whiter than people can get material by scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. That white. Uh, these dazzling white robes. And they said, men of Galilee. Notice how they're addressed. These fellows weren't from Judea, remember. They're not from Samaria. They're from the lake district up there, Galilee. Jesus Grew up in Nazareth, changed water to wine at a little town going from Nazareth over to the lake called Cana. And then on over to now Tiberias had become the major city built in name of the emperor, the, the, the Caesar in Rome. The ten little towns around, the Decapolis. Okay. These are Galileans. And here are these witnesses from God. Call them men of Galilee. Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? In the same way they'd ask the women, why are you looking for the crucified one here? He is not here. He has been raised. This Jesus. So again, Luke is emphasizing the importance of God's being, having been present in a real person. This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He will come again. Okay. And the advent, four weeks every year, Christians around the world, the liturgical churches more than the others, some of them jump right to Christmas, but the liturgical churches understand the need to be prepared. Adventus in Greek is the coming toward, the coming toward. So again, Dr. Craddock says, whether first he comes or each one of us goes, tomorrow we all meet the Lord. Tomorrow we all meet the Lord. Okay, so they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. Now, Olivet was just outside Jerusalem. We, about three miles. It's just a hill. Nothing major there. The little town of Bethany where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lives right there. Okay. Uh, and, of course, you can tell where it gets its name. Olive is the Mount of Olives. Okay. Uh, so they're standing out at the Mount of Olives where Jesus prayed so desperately the Thursday night that he was arrested and the next day tried and crucified. They're back there on this little, this little hill called the Mount of Olives or Olivet. When they had entered the city, oh, notice one other thing. Here again, this is a, uh, a way that Jews would understand what Luke's saying. Gentiles would not. It says, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. You know what that means? You could only walk a few steps on the Sabbath. Any other day, you could walk as far as you can walk. You can walk 20 miles, help yourself. Not on the Sabbath. And you know that in, if you've read the papers, you know that in Israel today, you have represented in the Knesset, their House of Representatives, you have 23 political parties. 
And no one of them has a majority. 23 different parties. So for Netanyahu to be head of that government, he had to make concessions. You know, to get these five and these four and these three and these 11, he had to make concessions. And one of those was, for years when we'd go to Israel, they had every hotel had to have one elevator that was designated the Sabbath elevator. And the Sabbath elevator was designed so that you didn't even have to push a button on the Sabbath. That could be considered work by the ultra-conservatives, the Orthodox. So we stayed in Hyatt hotels on different times. Beautiful hotel. You learn, don't go to that one. It's going to stop at every floor, going up and coming down from Friday sundown till Saturday sundown. It's going to happen. Well, guess what? In the most recent election, when Netanyahu came back to power, he had to make a concession that every elevator in every hotel will stop at every floor on the Sabbath. Okay. To get those four, or however many he needed, to, to make a government. All right. What I'm saying is, Luke is, thinks he's helping you understand. Even see, He's writing to people, many of whom have never seen Jerusalem. These are Gentiles. They've fanned out now across the Roman world, around the Mediterranean. They may have never been to Jerusalem in their lives. Mount of Olives, how far is that? Well, it's not far. A Sabbath day's journey. That's just a few feet. You see, it's not a long way. A Jewish Sabbath, their day set apart. So those of you who've been there know how close it is. You stand on those olive trees. You're looking at the wall of the old city. Just You go down a little ravine, 50 yards, and up 100 yards. Boom, you're at the gate. Sealed up by the Muslims, of course, all those centuries ago. All right. So when they had entered the city, they'd gone this little short walk from the Mount of Olives into the old city. They went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Now, here Luke helps us know that that probably that's where the disciples had been all this time. Same room where they had the Passover. Uh, When Jesus appeared to them that first Sunday night, the day that he had been raised. It was in that rented upper room, we think. Uh, That's where Thomas was the next week with them when Jesus appeared again. So we think it was that same room they had rented for Passover where they're still staying. Uh, Luke says Jesus had told them, don't leave until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So basically the the thing that they have to deal with now in in the days while they wait is uh, he seemed to have wanted 12 disciples to be closest to him, somehow representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Judas is gone now. He's taken his own life. What are we going to do? And so they have a prayer and they roll the dice and Matthias wins or loses, as the case may be. It's going to cost him his life down the road that he becomes one of the twelve. But that's what happens. So they replace Judas with Matthias. Let's go on to chapter 2, if that's all right with you. Or even if it isn't, let's go on to chapter (laughs) 2. All right. When the day of Pentecost had come. Now, let's stop a second and and look at the word Pentecost. And uh, you know that penta in Greek, five. Five. So, the big building in Washington where we house our military leadership, we call the Pentagon. It's a five-sided building. Five-sided building. When Gail and I were there in May, uh, the hotel where we stayed to get a better rate out of downtown Washington, D.C., we took a bus to the Pentagon station to get on the subway and go on with the way we wanted to spend the rest of our day. So there's a subway station just right outside the main gate to the Pentagon. There it is, the five-sided building. So in this case, the penta is five, and the last syllable, costa, is ten. Okay, so ten times five, fifty. Pentecost is fifty. That means fifty days after Passover. This is counting Jewish time, not Gentile time. We know that a week of weeks, therefore it's sometimes called a feast of weeks, a week of weeks, seven times seven, after Passover, the Jews came together again. That's the significance of this second chapter story, is that once again, the city is going to fill up with pilgrims who've come now for the feast of weeks. And so after their big holy day, a festival day, seven times seven, the next morning... Something significant happens on the 50th day. 
we're really going to run out of time. I don't want to get too far into this because this is really, really important. We have a Methodist church in Edmond, Oklahoma that chose to name itself. It's a new church. or just a, uh, 10 years old maybe now. They call themselves Acts 2. The name of the church is Acts 2 United Methodist Church. Guess what they emphasize? Uh, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. Uh, a lot of, lot of Holy Spirit going on at Acts 2. Uh, so this is a very important story, and I, and I don't want to, to minimize it whatsoever. We've got just a couple of minutes if you have any questions about anything said today or anything that I left hanging for you with the Gospel of John. We'll be glad to go back there for a moment as well. Yes, sir. The question is, uh, do lay people have a responsibility other than uh, through acts of kindness uh, to others uh, of helping God tell his story? Dr. Swartford, I think I know how much it would help Boston Avenue Church if our people would tell others about something that's helping them. Um, Gee, you know, I get so much help from my Sunday school class. I've learned so much from my disciple Bible class. I've, I've, I gain so much from singing in the chancel choir and, and becoming so familiar with the texts of these great anthems and so on. Uh, let me say it this way to you. I've been doing all of our calling, as you know, for almost seven years now. Our people are warm and gracious once people come to church. Not once in seven years has anyone said to me, I came to your church and nobody spoke to me. They do tell me that about other churches they've tried and no one spoke. Uh, We tried three churches, nobody spoke to us. We decided to try your church. They've never said to me, I came to your church, nobody spoke to me. On the contrary, they talk about how warm and gracious our people are. But... Almost never does anybody say, I came to your church because my friend told me about your church. I came to your Sunday school class because my friend said she had gotten a lot of help. He had gotten a lot of help from that class. You may know that around the world, volunteer organizations have had a really difficult time the last 20 years. There's a famous book written called Bowling Alone because back there 40 years ago, Half of America belonged to bowling leagues. You know, you've seen all those bowling shirts. My little tiny church way out in the country when I was a student were in a bowling league. And they drove into Carthage 20, 20 miles to, to bowl in the bowling league. And what they said is, there's some bowling, bowling uh, parlors. They're still doing really well. But virtually no bowling leagues today. People bowl alone or they bowl with one friend. The organization went. So what they're discovering is that there was a time when sororities and fraternities began to decline. There was a time when lodges of different kinds, fraternal organizations, declined in membership. Kiwanis had a hard time. Lions had a hard time. Rotary, you know, got to a certain point, and we have to fight like crazy to maintain the level where we are now. Same things happen to churches, trying to get people to make a commitment. You know, people don't. They're not joiners like they were 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Well, Rotary decided to find out why why were these volunteer organizations not doing so well. And uh, they got you know one of the best Rotarians we had in Germany and one of the best in England and one of the best in France and one of the best in Japan and one of the best in Calcutta. Got all these people on a committee, and they set out to find out why are not more people joining Rotary. And they finally wrote a book about this thick, You can skip through all the rest of it. Just get to the last two pages. And it says, we discovered that people do not join Rotary because no one has asked them. No one has asked them to join Rotary. No one has said, do you know what Rotary has done in the fight against polio? Do you know what our... I mean, we have spent nearly a billion dollars trying to drive this disease from the planet. It's tremendous. 1985, when I was president of the downtown club, old Dr. Sabin, who developed the oral vaccine, said there's still a half million new cases of polio every year in the world. Not in the, not in the United States, not in Western Europe, in Africa, in India, a major part of it. 
a half million new cases a year. Last year, fewer than 100. Bill Gates has said, you Rotarians are this close. I give you 100 million to help you out. I mean, we're this close. You've seen Jane Goodall and others in, 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 in advertisements recently. Rotary, you're this close to, to, to eradicating this, this disease. Well, nobody's told me. Nobody's told me. Why don't you join this organization? Look at all the good it does. That's just one thing. But anyway, uh, nobody's told them. So, yes, I think we all have some responsibility. Gail's very good about this when she and I are at the supermarket or somebody and somebody will walk up to me and say, uh, oh, I know you. I watch you on television. Gail says, why don't you come next Sunday and try it? You would like to come to our church. Yeah. I'll see you. Don't go, don't go away if you haven't been to church.